So we're going to kind of go back through what we, we read this last week, but just with a shortness of time, we really only covered the first four verses, which is why we're covering this whole section again. But we're going to cover some things that we did not get to last week. I want to ask you a question just to begin with, and the question is, what do people mean when they say they love Jesus or when they say they love God? What do people mean, right? It can mean a variety of things. If you say to me that you love Jesus, that could mean, honestly, something totally different than the person sitting next to you. It really could, based on the, what we see today in our culture, even in Christian culture. So I want you to just think about that for a moment. What do you mean when you say, I love Jesus? Or do you say that? Do you love him? Is it um, sentimental? Is it like more of a sentimental love? It kind of sounds nice, gives you good feelings. Is it like a close friendship? You have friends that you love, that you care for, so that's how you love Jesus, like a close friend. Is it adoration? So you guys can get the picture. There's, there's different levels or meanings for what someone might say when they say they love Jesus. So the text this morning, everything that we just read, and I, I hope to break this down so we can hear it in this, in this context, but the text this morning is filled with doctrine about love. You probably already noticed it. It's doctrine about love, both how a disciple loves Christ, but also how Christ loves his disciples, and both of those matter. It doesn't just matter that God loves us. It also matters that we love him. And this text does an incredible job in, in laying those two doctrines out side by side. So we're going to just dive right in. Consider verse 18 with me once again. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. So this was their concern, apparently. Why Jesus is speaking again in this upper room discourse as they've already been troubled and they've dealt with Judas and he's gone. And so all this stuff is going on. And again, this is their concern that they would be left in a state of vulnerability like an orphan. I think this is an incredible text that gets us to think about the love of God in a, in a way that maybe we don't think about every day from the perspective of an orphan. Most, unless you're an orphan, you don't think that way. You have to make yourself think like an orphan. Because if you grew up with moms and dads in any form or people in your life regularly loving you consistently, then you can't think like an orphan. But they at this moment, are, Jesus is speaking into their heart, to their heart, to the issue, saying, I will not leave you as orphans. Now, orphans feel unsafe. Orphans feel abandoned, unloved, uneasy. Uneasy about life, uneasy about what's next. They're just not sure. Because they've been left by their parents, whether by death or abandonment or some other reason. There's a variety of reasons. This isn't a study on adoption or orphans, but just a little bit of understanding. So for Jesus to say this now, in this moment, is like, it's like he's saying all your struggles, though they are real, they're temporary. All, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Your, your struggles are real. You feel like an orphan now. He's not, dis, he's not diminishing the fact that they feel that way. Notice that. But he is saying there's going to come an end to that. And the end to that is recognizing that he will come for them. That's where the orphan mentality goes away. Because Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. This is love, church. This is love. The love that the father has that is like a father for an orphan child. And he ties this love to assurance of three different things. And this is how I want to break this down. There's some, I'm gonna, we'll put these up on the screen so you can take notes. And I want you to just take note of this assurance. And he's speaking this assurance into their fear and their uneasiness. They're wondering, does Jesus love us? If he's leaving, what does this mean? I thought he would be around forever. Why is he leaving us? I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And then he begins to speak to them some incredibly loving words. If you move on from verse 18, he says, Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live also, you will live. And so the first thing that he gives them assurance in is about his resurrection. He assures up us of his love through the resurrection. Now tie that to your brain somehow. 
When you doubt the love of God, you doubt the love of Christ, think of the resurrection. It means so much more than many Christians give credit. It's, it's such an incredible thing. And here's why it's speaking of the resurrection. He says, yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you also will live. That's the resurrection. Because I live, not just live, but I live forever. Because he will conquer death, you get to live in my life. You get to have my life. And this idea of a little while in the world will not see me, that makes a whole lot of sense around the resurrection. Because when he rose from the dead, he showed himself to the disciples, not to the whole world. He showed himself to the disciples. And that was an incredibly encouraging moment. Wouldn't it have been? Hey, he said he was going to show himself to us. And here he is. He's, he's alive. But the whole world didn't get to see. And there's a reason for that. Because of his love for his disciples, for his people. He revealed himself to them. And because he lives, we can live. This is how directly the life of a Christian is connected to the life of Christ. We're so closely connected. Because he lives, I I mean, do you think that way? I live because Christ lives. Or I live, just put the, whatever, fill in the blank. Life is blank. Life is vacations. Life is RV life. Life is retirement. Life is the beach. Life is Jesus Christ. And everything else seems puny and ridiculous compared to Christ. All of it. It really does. I'm not saying if you're going to retire, you're doing some ridiculous thing. Okay? That's not what I'm saying. Or that beaches are bad. But you get what I'm saying. Life is not those things. And the disciples were still a little confused about this. And Jesus is saying... It's, it's about my resurrection. You want to be assured of my love that I won't leave you as orphans? I'm going to rise again. I'm going to die. He's already told them he's going to die. And I'm going to come back to life. And you will live because I live. That's the first assurance, his resurrection. Hold on to that, church. Believe in that. Trust in that. The second thing is he assures us of his love by giving us the Holy Spirit. And we've already talked about the Holy Spirit a bunch from the beginning of chapter 14. His promise to give us the Holy Spirit as another helper. So that's already been in our brains a little bit. But here's what he says. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. Did you catch that in our text? He says that, let's look at verse 19 again. Yet a little while, the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. Also, you will live. In that day, verse 20, you will know that I am in the Father and you in me and I in you. He's speaking of a day where they will be more assured then. He says, in that day. There's coming a, there was coming a day for the disciples where they will be so assured of what Christ is talking about in that moment. They didn't get it yet. But we don't have any excuse, guys. We're 2,000 years later. They were a few hours previous. Three or four days before the resurrection. They didn't get it yet. We don't have an excuse. So this is, Jesus is speaking still prior to the resurrection, prior to the Holy Spirit coming. He says, in that day you will know that I am in the Father. This is most likely describing the day of Pentecost, and it makes a lot of sense. Because he says, in that day you will be assured that I went to the Father. What did he just promise that would happen when he goes to the Father? You will receive the Holy Spirit. The helper that he promised came on the day of Pentecost. And we can read about it in Acts chapter 1. In that day, and they would have known, right? Tongues of fire, an incredible moment where the Holy Spirit comes upon the church and they're filled with power that they did not have before. Strength to be witnesses, strength to see. And all that Jesus is talking about starts to make way more sense in that moment. So think about that. In that day, what will you know? In that day, you will, you will know that I am in the Father. They would be thinking, Jesus, is in the, he's in the presence of the Father again because he told us when he goes to the Father, he's going to give us the Holy Spirit. Isn't that cool? And now the Holy Spirit is on the earth in dwelling believers, giving strength and power to the church to be witnesses for Christ. Jesus died, he rose, he revealed himself to his disciples not to the whole world. Then he ascended to heaven to be with the Father. He sent the Holy Spirit who is the other helper. 
And we covered that a little bit last time, this other helper. Jesus was sort of the original helper that walked along, alongside the disciples, the advocate. It's the same word in 1 John when he says Jesus Christ is the advocate, the helper. Same word. But Jesus said, I will send you another helper. He is my ambassador. He's constantly pointing back to me. He's revealing to you all truth. So the resurrection was an assurance of his love because it literally validates everything he ever said. I hope you know that. You need to know that. The resurrected Christ validates everything he said. So why do people not believe in Christ? It's blindness. It's just blindness. There's not some incredible skill that you have that you believe Jesus and other people don't. It's the grace of God. That you've, you're not blind anymore. God has un, unblinded your eyes to see the truth because it's really a plain thing, right? The resurrection, it happened. It is a historical fact that Jesus died and the grave was empty three days later. We already know that they deceived the community in order to try to hide his resurrection. The truth was covered and suppressed in order to further the cause of Satan as well. But that was an assurance of his love. The resurrection and then the gift of the Holy Spirit is an assurance of his love because he is to help you and I, the church, at all times in the Christian life. So when you need help, which is every day, every moment, every minute, you're probably thinking every second I need this. I need God in my life and that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The constant help the internal dwelling of the Holy Spirit to give you strength, to lead you, to point you to Christ, to give you, to illumine your heart and your eyes to understanding Scripture. I hope you guys pray before you read Scripture. I mean, how many people read Scripture and go, I don't know what I just read? Or I don't understand it. You need the teacher. The teacher is the Holy Spirit. So we pray, and we pray until we get it. We pray until we have been taught by Him, and we trust Him with it. And then the third thing, we have the resurrection, assurance of his love, the giving of the Holy Spirit. And then the third thing is this one final piece that's really a byproduct of the first two, and it's this. He assures us of his love by giving us peace. He gives peace specifically to disciples of Jesus Christ, to followers of Christ, that he does not give to those that do not trust him, those that are outside of Christ, don't have the same peace Let's look at what he says. Verse 21. Actually, we'll just jump down a little bit. Verse 25. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring, you, bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. He's saying he's going to give them something else, something that comes as a result of both his resurrected life, his life that is resurrected, ascended to the Father, and the spirit that he will give. He's saying, I'm I'm also going to give you peace. I'm, I'm leaving you with my peace. So those who believe and trust in the risen Christ are indwelled by the Spirit of Christ and have a peace from Christ that the world cannot give you. And he makes that distinction. It's not like the world's peace. Why? Why does he say that? Because people seek peace from the world in some way. Some other thing. We need peace in our lives, so we, we go to other things, other substances, other entertainment or people or family. We, we want peace, and so we're reaching for it. That's a natural thing. But Jesus tells you that the peace he gives is not like the world gives. So I thought it'd be good for a moment to just think about what kind of peace can the world give. The the only kind of peace that the world can give is circumstantial peace. That's it. It can't give lasting peace, but circumstantial. Based solely on what's happening around you right now in the moment. The world can also give interrupted peace. And that's circumstantial peace. It can be interrupted. So think about when you are the most peaceful in life. I want you to just picture right now when the last time was that you were most peaceful, at peace. Kids are in bed. Why did I say that first? I don't know. It's just, it just comes to mind. 
the dog is quiet, you have a moment to yourself, a long-awaited moment to yourself. You ever, you know, sometimes it's like two minutes, like, ah, you know, you're watching the sunset, maybe that's where you go, you're sitting in your tree stand. Oh, I've been in a tree stand before where I'm like, this is so peaceful, probably because I never see any deer, right? That's another story. But whatever it is, all of those have something in common. Whatever you plug in that blank for where is your peace, where do you find peace, the thing that they all have in common is that they are all so easily interrupted. In a moment, it changes. Kids wake up, gone. The peace is gone. Anything that you cling to as circumstantial peace around you, it can be in a moment change and be absolutely gone. Jesus says, the peace I give you is not like the world can give you. So I think the first thing we need to cling to is that whatever that peace is, and we're going to talk about it in a moment, it is something that is uninterrupted. It's not based on circumstance. Praise God. There is a peace in this world that is constant and eternal and never fades away. And it is uniquely for followers of Jesus Christ. Nobody else. You can't follow something else or some other gospel or some other religion and find this peace. Jesus says, I leave you this peace. Nobody else had it to even give in the first place. Only Christ. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Don't you love how personal he makes it? My peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Because the peace that Jesus gives is ultimate peace. And it's peace with God. To be at peace with God. That's what it is. That's what Jesus gives to his people. To be at peace, to be at rest with God Almighty. God the Father. God the Judge. God the Creator. At peace with him. Not worried about judgment. Not fearful of the wrath of God. At peace with him. And that's only for followers of Jesus Christ who have trusted him and put their faith in him. Romans 5.1, I want to put three scriptures up in a row, just all of these from Romans, and notice the, the link between the Holy Spirit and all of these. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's speaking of our justifying work, the justifying work of Christ that makes us in the system of a court We are justified before God, and he makes us at peace with God. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Circumstantial. See that? It's not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not a matter of eating and drinking. It's not a matter of worldly things. The kingdom of God is not like that. The kingdom of God is a people who are at peace because of righteousness. It says, not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy. Where? In the Holy Spirit whom Christ gave. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Isn't that beautiful? So, so incredibly important. That's where peace is. That's where hope is. It's in Christ and it's in the spirit that he gives to us through faith in him. So it is faith in Jesus alone that justifies a person before God. And in that alone is where we find peace with God. The person who claims to be at peace with God but does not trust in Christ, no matter what they tell you, they are not at peace with God. Outside of Christ, there is no peace with God. There is only condemnation. That person is not justified, not at peace, but is under condemnation at this very moment. Until the justifying work of Christ is applied to that person's life through faith in the work of the cross and the Holy Spirit indwelling that person, applying the redemptive work of Jesus. Outside of that, only condemnation. But to be at peace with him, and some of you know this, the relief, the joy, the grace, the forgiveness, understanding that grace, not orphans anymore, just tying it back to that, not orphans anymore, at peace, not orphans, but sons and daughters 
of the Father. That's why Jesus could claim this to be his peace that he gives because he was at peace with the Father. He had a a relationship with the Father, Father to Son, one. And we get to share that now. This peace confounds many. It's a peace that surpasses all understanding. And as Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, it surpasses understanding and it guards our heart in Christ. It's a peace that passes all understanding. It's, it confounds even the one who has the peace. I'm sure you're confounded by it at times. I, I wish we would be more confounded by it because I think a lot of times, I don't know, I can't really put my finger on it, but a lot of Christians today lack peace. If you can figure it out, tell me. Let's talk about it. Because that's why we're here, church, to help us believe the gospel, to help each other take what we are struggling with and the blinders that tend to kind of set in and the backsliding that happens, and we lack peace. But Christians should not lack peace. If we base it solely on what Jesus is saying here, we could be going through hell today. And because of Jesus Christ and because of eternity and the life he gives us, we can be at peace because we're at peace with God. And so how do we fight unrest in this world? How do we fight the lack of peace? The gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ. Believing what he's done As it said in this last text in Romans, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You have to believe it. So we got to believe it, church. But for the disciples, taking it back to our text, the, the sin in the world and in their own hearts caused a whole lot of doubt. So they're just thinking, you're leaving? That's it. Like They can't get past the fact that he's leaving. They did not rejoice that he was going to the Father, and he's going to address that in a moment. He actually rebukes them because they didn't rejoice. They were filled with worry because he was going to the Father. But Jesus says he has something better than his physical presence on earth. Yep, there was something better than him physically being there. He has an advocate with whom he, had the, whom he and the Father will give. So there's almost this... You know, you read some of the commentaries and some of the theologians, and they're actually debating. So who sent the Holy Spirit, Jesus or the Father? I think both of them. Like, there was an agreement for eternity that this would work this way, right? So I don't go, this isn't, it's not like this huge thing. It, it, it's okay if you say, no, it's, it must have just been Jesus. But we're not going to make a big deal about it. The point is the Spirit came. He sent the advocate to dwell on the inside of us but he will send them after he dies and rises to be with the Father. Again, our perspective, we can see it. They could not see it. Now we're going to backtrack a little bit. Look at verse 21 with me. He says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. So we've talked about the love of God for us. Now we're turning it around to see what Jesus says about our love for him. He who loves me will be Loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. That's an incredible promise. Now, Jesus is not speaking of a works-based salvation. In case, there's some, in case there's some part of you that's questioning, wait a minute, so do I have to love God enough in order for him to love me back? No, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's speaking consistent with the rest of Scripture that saving faith leads to loving obedience. Saving faith leads to loving obedience. So if there's a person in this room, or if there's a person anywhere, that is not lovingly obeying Jesus Christ, there is a massive question mark over your life whether you are truly in Christ and saved. That's what Scripture lays out. If you do not want to obey Jesus, or have the love or the desire to Him, then you are not born again because He was born again loves God and His commandments. And in the beauty of the gospel and the reconciling work of Christ, now those commands aren't burdensome. They're not burdensome anymore. So this is not a works-based salvation. It is a consistent teaching in all of Scripture when you put it all together that saving faith leads to obedience. So what do you think about the word obedience, church? What do you think about the word obedience? Is it 
something that gives joy to your heart to think about obeying Jesus Christ? Or is it just a pain in the rear? I, I'm serious. If, I want you to think, do an assessment on yourself. When you think, I have to obey everything Jesus says, is it a pain to you or is it a joy for you? Even a joy to struggle in it. I'm not saying do you do it perfectly. Nobody does. But is it a, it is a desire of your heart to do what Jesus says? Everything he says in Scripture. And I think this should cause a whole lot of conviction in many, many hearts. And a lot of people buck against it. Some wrongly believe what has been called hyper-grace be careful when you look these things up if you decide to Google hyper grace, but it's out there. It's this, it is a, it's a messed up unbiblical idea that God doesn't care if you do the right thing or not because he's so gracious. Because he'll forgive you anyway, so why does it matter? Maybe you've thought that way. Maybe there was a point in your life, maybe you, maybe that, I don't know. Just, it's, it's, it's something we need to reject. It's devilish. It's unbiblical. And we need to reject all forms of that doctrine that allows sin because God is gracious. That's not what Scripture teaches. It's not what Jesus taught. That's the teachings of man to excuse sinful, unholy life and still claim to be a Christian. Because, believe it or not, there's a lot of benefits, worldly benefits, from claiming to be a Christian. But that's not the Christianity that Jesus taught. Okay, Jesus taught about a life of dying to self, laying down your life, picking it up, picking up your cross and following him, obedience. So grace changes the heart from apathy towards God to love for God. That's what grace does. Grace changes the heart that is apathetic about obedience and commandments to being a heart that loves Christ and his commandments. All his commandments. I I wanted to just all of them. Like we don't get to just pick and choose which ones are the good ones and our favorites. The gospel teaches us that because Jesus stood in our place as the perfect law keeper, that's why the commands aren't burdensome anymore. So we don't go into obeying Christ with this great fear of messing up. We go in with all of our heart to do everything we can because he loved us and died for us, recognizing that Part of his substitutionary work was to fulfill the law for us. To do it all, to be perfect on our behalf. So it handles the one who is overly self-righteous to realize, wait, no, you can't do it on your own, you need Jesus. And the one who's very, very hard on themselves to think, I'll never live up to this because I can't do all this. Well, Jesus did it for you. He fulfilled it for you. Both ends of the spectrums are met in the gospel. We all need Jesus Christ. All of us. And being clothed in his righteousness, we now desire holiness. If we are clothed in his righteousness, we desire holiness and doing all that he asks, but without the burden of penalty for failure, because again, he took the penalty for us. Now look at the blessing of what's in this text, the blessing of being a person who loves and keeps the word. You get the love of the Father and the Son. He who loves me and keeps my commandments will be loved by me and, I, and my Father will love him also. Very specific words from Christ that are so comforting. And this phrase, I will manifest myself to you. All included in that. Not only will I and the Father love you, but I will manifest myself to you. This word manifest, it means he shares himself with us. He gives us himself. We get Jesus Christ And then in verse 23, this is an answer to Judas. Notice how John actually plugs in there now, not Iscariot. Very important. At this point, you don't want to be associated with Judas Iscariot. Like literally that just happened. Jesus just gave him permission to walk out of the room and go to the garden and do what he's going to do. So this other Judas, not Iscariot. Questions, how, what's the difference between how you're going to manifest yourself to us and to the world? And this is the answer. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Verse 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. So you see the distinction. The world cares nothing for obedience to Christ. 
That's the world. Cares nothing for it. Those who truly love Jesus, though, are obedient to Jesus. So I really do want to lay out a very clear biblical challenge to you that if it's convicting, rejoice that the Holy Spirit loves you enough to convict you and bring you back to love and obedience to Jesus Christ. If you're walking a compromised life right now where you're thinking, uh, you know, I love Jesus and I'm coming to church, but I'm not really obeying him, and I, you could even pinpoint the areas that you know you're not obeying him. The question is just simple. Do you want to be like the world that has not the love of the Father or the love of Christ and shirks every command of Jesus because they hate him? Or will you be like a follower of Jesus and love his word and love his commandments. Those who are obedient to Jesus have a love for Jesus that grows out of obedience. I think, honestly, sometimes a lack of love for Christ comes because of an unwillingness to obey. A lack of love for him. I'm not saying that your obedience earns his love, but when we obey the one who did so much for us, our love for him will grow. Your love for him will grow. And you will be loved by him and he will make his home with you. Just think about these words. I will make my home with you. That word for home is the same word that was translated to rooms in in verse 2. I have many rooms. I go to prepare a place for you. Same word, home. I will make my home with you. It's like Jesus is connecting all of this and saying to disobey Christ is to reject the reconciling work of the cross that prepared the way of reconciliation, reconciliation with God. You're rejecting. To say, I don't care about obedience to him is to reject the work of the cross. It's to make it mean nothing. So it means something to believers. So so should obedience to him because of who he is. The sheer magnitude of who he is is worthy of our faith and our obedience. So we can say based on this text that church, God wants obedience from you because Because his commands are life. He wants obedience from each and every one of us for us to follow him. Now, this is not far from even just a worldly understanding. A a good father or a good mother understands what what it means when the child obeys them. When When there's a good relationship. Right? It's not about lording anything over, but that willing submission and willing to obey and do what mom and dad say, it's, it, that's harmonious. It's beautiful. It, it makes sense. And so the most loving being in the universe loves us through Christ and what we say we don't have to obey him, we, we definitely need to. We should. We should want to. And we need to. It's not legalistic, by the way, to say we need to, we need to obey Jesus. So if somebody's told you, no, we don't. Jesus died for us. We don't need to obey him. It's not anywhere in Scripture. But there are people that are very confused about that, that they think that somehow the cross was an event to make a bunch of wishy-washy, uncertain, unholy people. No, he came to wash his bride, to present her spotless and white before him. We need to be thinking about this, church. His commands are truth. His commands are life. And to obey the, the Christ and his word, this word, this scripture, these Bibles that you have, to obey this is how you remain assured of his love. So all of this connected, the assurance of his resurrection, the, the Holy Spirit he gives, the peace that he gives, and the fact that in the midst of all this, Jesus says, by the way, if you love me, you're, you will keep my commandments. Your Life will be about my word, my commandments, what I say to you. That's what it will be all about. Now, they did not fully understand, and the world, excuse me, they did not fully understand, and would not until Christ was risen from the, from the dead, and, and, and we know. And then also from this, the, the fact that the Spirit would come later, and then they would have a greater understanding. But they did not rejoice at his departure in verse 28, and this proves it. He says, you heard me say to you, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced. 
Because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. So there's the rebuke. It's interesting, right? He rebuked. He even challenges their love three years into their life with Christ, and he's challenging whether they love him. Did you guys see that? If you would have loved me, if you loved me, you would have rejoiced. So there's even something incomplete about that, about where their relationship is at. Now, they've come a long way, haven't they, from the fishermen on the shore, fishermen on the shore of Galilee to now following Christ every day and walking with him. Now they're in the upper room with him, preparing to go to the cross. You heard me say, I'm going away and I will come to you. If you love me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Now, just to answer something that kind of comes up as a question, that that should come up as, what is he talking about? The Father is greater than I. That Jesus just said that. So a little theology here. I thought they were one, right? I thought they were equal. But Jesus just said the Father is greater than I. But this is not hard to get around or understand, to 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 see what he's actually saying. Jesus is referring to his humility, even in just the very act of his going up to the Father, the Father was never, ever called to be humble like a man. But, but the Son was. In his humility, there was a difference in even their calling and their ministry to this world. In the redemptive plan, the Son was called to humble himself low. And in that sense, the Father is greater than Jesus. In that sense. So in that sense, the Father was greater. Not superior, not, not more powerful or with more authority, but Jesus would ascend to the Father, completing the redemptive journey, and then we can rejoice in this. They didn't rejoice, but we can rejoice. Like we, again, no excuses here. This is something we rejoice in, that that was completed, that he did the work, and it is done. Amen. So just notice these last words that close out this chapter. He says this in verse 30. I will no longer talk with you much, or much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. So Jesus is about to die a gruesome death in just a few hours, literally just a few hours. It will be the most satanic scene in history. It really was the most satanic scene in history, the death of Jesus Christ. And the reason why is because the ruler of this world, Satan, was coming. The ruler of Jesus is saying to the disciples, the ruler of this this world is coming, and because of that, this conversation is getting cut short. I'm about to die. We can't stay here and talk forever. Sorry. Sorry. Satan's hand was in the murderous schemes of the Romans and the Jews who were thirsty for the blood of Jesus. Satan's hand was in that. But the sovereignty of God was also on display. And we know that from Scripture. The sovereignty of God was also on display. And notice what Jesus says here. In the context of Satan, the ruler of this world, by the way, that is who the ruler of the world is. The ruler of this world. He doesn't rule the world, but he's the ruler of this world. He's on this earth. By the way, Satan is not in hell burning. That day will come where he will be destroyed, but he's on this earth. Along with many, many other demons. Many, many other dark demons. But Jesus says, he has no claim on me. (laughs) Guys, That is good news. Now, we can't say that, okay? Listen, I know you'd like to be able to say that Satan has no claim on you. In the sense of redemptive work, he doesn't. He can't accuse you, but he does have a claim. He has some way to get a talent in you because you're a sinner. Jesus wasn't even a sinner. Jesus couldn't do any wrong. There was nothing that that Satan could do to trip him up or coerce him or convince him to do something otherwise. It was the plan of Christ, to go to the cross willingly. Satan has no claim on me. I do as the Father commands me. 
And this is an important piece of the gospel, the willingness of Christ. This is where we need to understand the fellowship, the, just the incredible, what, the incredible nature of the gospel that God became man to willingly die for you, to willingly step up the hill and be crucified on a cross. Not because the ruler of this world had a claim on him, but because he did everything the Father commanded him to do. No coercion, no forcing, willing obedience to the Father, and how great that love is that he would go so far to make peace between me and God, to make peace between you and God. I love him for that. Do you guys love him? You love him. See how the love grows there? It starts there with the gospel. And then it brings you to a place of, I want to do everything that he says because of, look at what he's done for me. Look at who he is. Our love will show by imitating Christ's obedience. See, even Jesus put his obedience there. My willingness to do the commands of the Father, to do whatever he told me. That's why I'm going to the cross and I'm going willingly. And he lays that same pattern out for us to imitate him in a life of obedience. He obeyed the Father. In Christ, we are also to obey the Father. We're to do everything that he says and asks. This is no doubt this morning, right? We don't have any doubt this morning based on what we've read through the resurrection, the helper that he sent, and the peace in our hearts. We don't have any doubt that he loves us. The proof is there. We've seen it. But let us love him and show such love by desiring obedience. And if you lack that today, church, that needs to be your prayer. As we go to the communion table in just a moment, God, I, I'm not desiring obedience Change my heart. Be desperate for it. It is the most important thing. It is the most important thing in the life of a believer that you are following Jesus Christ and that you're doing what he commands. That we would do this and that we would desire obedience, resting in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is also important. If we do this work outside of the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, then it becomes a religion to us. We just try to obey in order to earn something from God. So those, two, those aspects are so important together. He's given us, us his righteousness, and that grace is not a license to sin. That grace is a reminder of the sin that he died for. And it spurs us on to holiness, to righteousness, to obedience. And we have the helper. You don't have to do it on your own. We have each other. We have the church. We have the body of Christ. Such an important thing. Even just picture this for a moment, and then we'll close and we'll go into communion. If every believer is, is indwelt by the Holy Spirit of Christ, is it not then the intention that as the body of Christ gathers together and sees itself as members of one another, operating as we walk in the Holy Spirit, that there will be more strength for obedience, more help, as we come together, not just lone rangers with the Spirit indwelling us, but together. That's the intention of God, church. That's the intention of God for us as believers, to not do this alone, but we have the helper and we have the body of Christ. We have the body of Christ to help us live this out. Amen, church? It's a beautiful thing. I, I pray that God will minister to this, this to you into the deepest part of your hearts, that you would not reject him, that you would not... Uh, Push this word out. If you need to be spoken to today about obedience, then let the Holy Spirit speak to you. Come to him in repentance and uh, restore obedient fellowship with him, trusting in the righteousness of Christ. All right, let me pray and then we'll get into communion. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for every brother and sister that is here that has every right to the throne room of grace because of the work of Jesus Christ. We can approach you. We can come to you now. We can ask you for help because, God, we need help. I pray that you would revive the disobedient heart to obedience, not as a dead religion, but as a life-giving 
spiritual relationship with you because you have done everything for us. God, I pray your spirit would come upon this church, that you would remind us of the help that you have given us, the peace that you've given us, the assurance through your resurrection. If we love you, we will keep your commands. Help us, God. Give us that help today that we need. I pray that you draw people today to repentance, to confession, to wholeness again. And that all of this, I believe, God, we know that it'll, it'll affect our mission and what we do and how we love each other. Your word says that he who loves God also loves the brothers. So God, give us the grace to obey today. And we are thankful. We're so thankful for the cross of Christ. Thank you for dying for us, rising again, for ascending to the Father. Lord, lead the rest of our time together. We, we just rejoice in the gospel today. Thank you for this church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.